I'm going to start off by giving some background information on heat exchangers. First of all, what is a heat exchanger? According to the International Petroleum Industry Environmental Conservation Association, IPIECA, a heat exchanger is a device used to transfer heat from one medium to another. The Ohio State's Department of Mechanical Engineering defines it as a heat transfer device that is used for transfer of internal thermal energy between two or more fluids available at different temperatures. Many other sources define it similarly, as heat exchangers are commonly used devices. The mediums involved may be gas, liquid, or a combination of both. They may be separated by a wall or they may be in direct contact and mix. There are different types of heat exchangers and there are many ways to classify them. There are a ton of applications for heat exchangers. Some of these include air conditioning systems, refrigeration systems, furnaces, food and chemical processing, oil and petroleum refineries, power plants, steam engines, automobiles, and aircrafts, and so many more. Some factors that affect different types of heat exchangers include the construction style. Common construction styles of heat exchangers are plate type or tube type. Tube type heat exchangers are exactly what they sound like, a bundle of small tubes where the fluid flows through them. Plate heat exchangers utilize several layers of flat plates to create channels for the fluids to flow through. Flow is another factor. The fluids may flow parallel or co-currently, which is in the same direction. They may flow counter-currently in opposite directions, or they may be cross-flow where they flow perpendicularly to one another, or they could be a hybrid. The number of passes the flow makes also affects the heat exchanger. It can be single pass or a multi-pass device. And those are just a few of the many factors that can play a role in affecting a heat exchanger. As you can see in this chart where many others are mentioned, there are different types of heat exchangers. There are more than just these types, but we are gonna focus on parallel flow and counter-flow heat exchangers, shell and tube heat exchangers, compact heat exchangers, and cross-flow heat exchangers, which we'll be focused on more later in this video. While heat exchangers may differ in design, construction, number of passes, etc., the mode of operation and effectiveness is greatly affected by the direction of flow of the fluid. Parallel and counterflow heat exchangers are the simplest, most common arrangements of flow paths. As seen in the image on the right, parallel flow is when the hot and cold fluids move in the same direction, and counterflow is when the fluids move in opposite directions, as mentioned. In comparable conditions, the counterflow arrangement is more efficient, or more heat is transferred, than in a parallel flow heat exchanger. The parallel flow heat exchanger can be beneficial if the goal is to bring the two fluids to nearly the same temperature. Shell and tube heat exchangers are also popular, especially in industry. Their name does them justice. They are literally shellings with tube inside of them. The fluids flow through the tubes. The tubes can either be in a U shape, shown in the first image, or straight. Shell and tube heat exchangers with straight tubes can either be single pass, where the fluid goes in one end of the tube and out the other, or multi-pass, where the fluid enters and exits on the same side. Compact heat exchangers are devices with high heat transfer area per volume. There are two types, plate and frame, where stacked plates are bonded together and the fluid is spread out over multiple plates, and plate fin, where the fins are inserted between parallel plates. The fluid flows between the fins, which can be triangular, rectangular, wavy, or perforated. Heat transfer area is increased with plate fin design. The last type I'd like to mention is cross-flow heat exchangers. This is the type we will focus on for our simulation. In a cross-flow heat exchanger, the fluids flow in perpendicular directions, as mentioned before. There are two main types, fin tubular and unfin tubular. Fin tubular cross-flow heat exchangers keep the fluids unmixed. The fluids between the fins is guided transversely to the tube flow direction. Unfin tubular cross-flow heat exchangers mix the fluids and heat is exchanged in all directions. The setups of these types can be viewed in the image on the left. So first and foremost, what is the difference between a mixed and unmixed fluid? A mixed fluid is when a fluid can move in any direction, and an unmixed fluid is one that has its direction of motion restricted. For example, the picture on the left down below is an example of a heat exchanger that allows for a mixed fluid, because the cross-flow fluid can move in either the x direction or the y direction. However, in the picture on the right, there are fins which would prevent the cross-flow fluid from moving in the y direction, resulting in an unmixed fluid. This brings me to my next topic, which is about finned versus unfinned heat exchangers. Adding fins to heat exchangers is important because it increases the surface area of the exchanger, which in turn increases the heat transfer rate. This will not always be necessary, but if you have a low heat transfer coefficient on the outside of the tubes, it might be worth considering adding fins to improve efficacy. Now there are two types of fins, longitudinal and transverse fins, each with their own expertise. An example of a longitudinal fin heat exchanger can be seen down below on the left, and a transverse fin can be seen on the right. Longitudinal fins are better for when you want the flow outside of the tube to run along the entire length of the tube, like double pipe heat exchangers. 
Transverse fins, on the other hand, are more often used for shell and tube heat exchangers or turbulent fluids because they can restrict movement. Now, there are many factors that can affect the performance of heat exchangers, but some of the more important ones are fluid velocity and the size of the tube. In regards to the fluid velocity, if you have higher speeds, the fluid will become more turbulent, which makes sense with what we know about Reynolds' number. If the fluid is more turbulent, the fluid will be continuously shuffling and allowing all of the fluid particles to meet the hot tube wall, thus increasing the amount of heat transferred. The size of the tube also matters because larger diameter pipes make a larger surface area for the fluid to come into contact with. This can increase effectiveness, but keep in mind the tubes need to be properly maintained and cleaned, or they can actually start to impair the effectiveness of the heat exchanger. Our goal is to examine the impact of flow type within cross-flow heat exchangers. Computational models of each system were used to investigate these effects. To best compare mixed and unmixed flows, all other parameters remain constant. This table summarizes those inputs. For the hot and cold fluid, we have specific heats of 1 and 2 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, respectively. Mass flow rates of 10 kilograms per second were used for both fluids. The temperature in for the hot fluid was 400 Kelvin, and the temperature in for the cold fluid was 300 Kelvin. There are four systems to examine, represented by three diagrams here. First on the far left is the completely unmixed system, in which neither fluid is allowed to mix with itself. In this diagram that's represented by these squared off sections, the fluid flows into each square, but once inside these channels, is unable to mix with the adjacent squares. In the real world heat exchanger, there are fins on these systems that prevent mixing within each fluid. Then we have the one fluid mix systems, of which there are two, one for the hot fluid being mixed and one for the cold fluid being mixed. And we see that those squares have been removed from the hot fluid in this diagram. This means that the fluid is allowed to mix from left to right in this system, which should have some effect on the temperature profile of the system. Finally, there's the both fluids mixed case, in which both hot and cold fluids are allowed to mix freely amongst themselves. Again, this will have a different effect on the overall temperature profile of the system. First, we'll examine the simulation results for the no mix and cross flow heat exchanger. We have two temperature profiles, one for the cold and one for the hot fluid. The cold fluid is moving left to right in the system, while the hot fluid moves from bottom to top. First thing we'll notice is that each of these temperature gradients are relying on two directions of travel. And so there's a dominant direction of travel, which is against the grain of the other fluid. So for the cold fluid, that is the horizontal direction, the hot fluid, it's the vertical direction. And then the minor direction, temperature changes occur because of the lack of mixing. So because cold fluid is unable to mix with itself, we see vertical differences in the temperature. Similarly, for the hot fluid, we see horizontal differences in the temperature because it is unable to mix amongst itself. For numerical results, we see that the heat exchange of the system is 547.5 kilowatts and the efficiency is 0.548. Moving on to the hot fluid mix system, we see that for the hot fluid, that temperature gradient is reduced to a single dimension, while the cold fluid temperature profile looks very similar to the previous systems. And the hot fluid temperature profile is reduced to the single dimension because it can mix with itself. So in the horizontal direction, there's no difference in temperatures at all, because at these points, we're given enough time, the temperature equals out through mixing of the hot fluid. We see with our numerical results that the heat transfer reduces to 544.85 kilowatts, and the efficiency drops to 0.545. Finally, there's a system where both fluids are allowed to mix. In this, both temperature gradients are reduced to a single dimension of travel, as would be expected based on the previous results. With no mixing, the cold fluid temperature profile only exists in the horizontal direction, whereas the hot fluid temperature profile only relies on the vertical direction. We see that our heat transfer is reduced even further to 542.26 kilowatts, while the efficiency drops again to 0.542. Overall, the unmixed fluid cross-flow heat exchanger is the most efficient option, allowing for the greatest heat transfer in our system. Allowing for mixing in either of the fluids decreases the heat transfer between the two fluids, as each fluid experiences greater heat transfer amongst itself in competition with the hot-cold heat transfer. In the unmixed system, more of the heat from the hot fluid is being transferred to the cold fluid, instead of being used to reheat some of the hot fluid that has already been cooled these differences are fairly small, 
but in a large industrial operation, they could have a truly appreciable effect. The following variables we have are Q, that will be the flow rate, um, and the units are in watts. U is the overall heat transfer coefficient in watts per meter squared Kelvin. The area is the surface area of the heat exchanger, and the units are meters squared. T is temperature in Kelvin. F is the correction factor, which is dimensionless. Um, Delta T LM is the logarithmic mean temperature difference in Kelvin. Y and Z are parameters um, that are both dimensionless that are used to, um, to find the correction factor. NTU is the number of transfer units, this is also dimensionless. And C is the capacity coefficient in watts per Kelvin. The subscripts are as follows. T is the tube, S is for shell, min and max are for minimum and maximum respectively, um, and C and H are for cold and hot respectively. These subscripts appear next to some of the variables, notably temperature and capacity coefficient, so I separated those. Simulations can be a great way to model the heat flux and efficiency of a cross-flow heat exchanger. However, we can also do these calculations by hand if desired. In order to start with these calculations, we can start with our original heat exchanger equation. We're also going to be adding in a correction factor to this equation. In order to determine the correction factor for a cross-flow heat exchanger, we will first need to determine two parameters, y and z. To calculate our y parameter, we will be subtracting the temperature of the cold liquid at the inlet from the temperature of the cold liquid at the outlet divided by the temperature of the hot liquid at the inlet minus the temperature of the cold liquid at the inlet. Then to find our Z parameter, we will need to subtract the temperature of the hot liquid at the outlet from the temperature of the hot liquid at the inlet and divide this value by the temperature of the cold liquid at the outlet minus the temperature of the cold liquid at the inlet. Now that we've determined these values, we need to put them to work. We can see that on the x-axis of these correction factor graphs, the y value is needed. Then there are multiple lines on the graph which display different z values. In order to determine the correction factor, which is listed on the y-axis, we will need to figure out the z value first and find this line. Then we need to find the value of this line at the value of our y value. For this problem, we'll consider the y value to be 0.5 and our z value to be 1.5. If we find the intersection of these two points and then trace over to the correction factor on the y-axis, we will determine that our correction factor is 0.8. Now this example was given for the case of a cross-flow single path heat exchanger with both fluids unmixed. There are also other cases such as one for the cross-flow single-pass heat exchanger with one fluid unmixed, as well as a third case shown here, a cross-flow tube passes, where the fluid flows over the first and second passes in series. Then once we determine our correction factor, we can return to our original equation for the heat flow. And now we'll be plugging in the correction factor along with our other values to solve for Q. To manually assess the effectiveness of our heat exchanger, we can use a method called NTU analysis. Similar to finding correction factors to determine the heat flow from the heat exchangers, there will also be graphs to determine the effectiveness based on the NTU analysis. In order to determine this effectiveness, we will also need two more parameters. The first one is the ratio of C min to C max. For the case of a cross-flow heat exchanger with one fluid mixed, we will now be looking at the ratio of the C mixed over the C unmixed. These C values that we're referring to in the first parameter are the capacity coefficients for the fluid. In order to determine the capacity coefficient, we will be multiplying the mass flow rate by the specific heat value. In this specific example, we have done this for the hot fluid. The other parameter that will be needed to determine the effectiveness will be the NTU term. Number of transfer units can be determined by multiplying the area of transfer as well as the overall heat transfer coefficient and then dividing this by the capacity coefficient of the minimum fluid. There are also three figures that we can use to determine the effectiveness of a cross-flow heat exchanger. The determination of which chart to use in order to determine the effectiveness can be figured out by looking at the internal structure of the heat exchanger. For this example, we will be looking at the chart for a cross-flow heat exchanger with both fluids unmixed, meaning that the heat exchanger is finned. We'll be doing a similar process to the previous example where we determined the heat flux and specifically the correction factor for this heat exchanger. In this example, however, we will now be using the ratio of the capacity coefficients and the number of transfer units to determine our effectiveness. For example, given a number of transfer units of three and a ratio of capacity coefficient minimum fluid over maximum fluid of 0.5, we can find the point where these two points overlap and then trace over to the effectiveness. In this case, it will be about 82%. To recap, these methods of calculating the correction factor using NTU analysis to find efficiency can be very effective for heat exchanger calculations if needed to be solved by hand. However, 
Given the nature of the large equations and many charts that are needed to calculate some of these terms, it is easy to see how a simulation can be far better than calculating by hand, especially in applications where multiple heat exchangers will need to be spec'd out.